camping can be one of the most enjoyable and rewarding experiences you ever have. But only if you're properly prepared with the right knowledge and the right gear. The objective of this program is to help you camp right the first time, so that every time afterwards is a whole lot of fun. Now, if you've never camped before, you may be thinking, is camping right for me? Well, if you have an appreciation for the great outdoors and Mother Nature in all her splendor, if you enjoy being with family and friends, if you like hiking, boating, swimming, fishing, or any other outdoor activity, or if you just want to take a vacation and don't have a lot of money to spend, then maybe you ought to give this camping thing a try. The next question is where do you want to camp? There are many ways to find a nice campground. The first and easiest is to check with friends who are campers. Find out which campgrounds they liked and which they didn't. Don't know anybody who camps? If you're hooked up to the internet, you've got a fabulous resource right at your fingertips. Go to any search engine, type in the state in which you'd like to camp, the word campground, hit return and see what turns up. My personal favorites are the national and state parks. Campgrounds in these areas are usually very clean, well-run, and inexpensive. Plus, they have all the amenities that make camping truly enjoyable, like washrooms and showers with hot, running water, fire pits and picnic tables at each campsite, and conveniently located garbage dumpsters. At the ranger station where you check in, you'll often find ice and firewood for sale. You'll be needing plenty of both, so it's always nice to have a source nearby. You may also want to consider a private campground. Although they cost a little more, these facilities often have such amenities as built-in swimming pools, convenience stores, and laundry facilities. If you don't know people who camp and you don't have a computer, never fear. You can always pick up a national campground directory, either at a camping store or at your local library. The directory will give you the rundown on all public and private campgrounds in the area you want to visit, including size of campground, number of campsites, camping season, amenities, phone numbers, you name it. Okay, so you've decided to go camping. Good. You've decided where to go camping. Very good. Now to the all-important question, what to bring camping? I keep a checklist handy that I always look over before I start packing for a camping trip. You can download my list for free at the Beginner's Guide to Camping website. First and foremost, you need a tent. The number of people you'll have sleeping in your tent will determine the size of the tent you need. Rule of thumb, always get a tent that will sleep two more people than you plan to have. If you're a family of four, get a six-man tent. Why? You'll need the extra room to store your duffel bags, backpacks, shoes, boots, and other gear. It's also nice, but not necessary, to have a tent you can stand up in. Makes getting in and out a little easier, as well as getting dressed and undressed. You'll want to set your tent up on level ground. If you don't, well, you get the picture. If for some reason you can't find level ground, be sure to set up your tent so that the door is at the bottom of the incline. And be sure to sleep so that your feet are towards the door. Doing otherwise could prove to be a real headache. Be sure the area under your tent is free of rocks and debris. You'll also want to put a ground cloth under your tent. The ground can get a little damp at night. A nylon or plastic ground cloth keeps the moisture away from the floor of your tent. Ground cloths are pretty inexpensive and can be picked up at most camping, home supply, or hardware stores. If need be, you can also use a plastic drop cloth found at any paint store. Ideally, all ground cloths are the same size as the floor of the tents they sit under. If your ground cloth is too big, fold the protruding edges underneath the cloth, not on top. Why? If it rains, you'll find out why. Water will get caught between the ground cloth and the tent, making your campsite moist and miserable. Today, almost all tents are made out of nylon. 
They're lightweight and durable, can be stored in a compact case, and they dry out quickly. Best of all, tents today can be set up in a matter of minutes, thanks in part to a thing called shock cord. Shock corded tent poles have an elastic cord inside that keeps all the sections together and facilitates quick and easy assembly. Most tents also come with a rain fly. This is a canopy that attaches to the top of the tent and works as an umbrella to keep the rain off. Canopies can also be purchased separately. They come in all sizes and are great at providing rain and sun protection. If you're going to use a canopy, take the time to set it up properly. Anchor the poles with line and stakes. Canopies set up in a hurry often come down just as fast. Other things to look for in a tent are good quality zippers, especially around the door where they'll get a lot of use. Pockets are useful for holding your glasses, keys, flashlights, any small items you want to keep handy. Zippered windows let the sunshine and fresh air in during the day, and if it's cool at night, they can be zipped up to retain heat. It can, however, get really stuffy in a tent with all the windows closed. That's why it's nice to have small vent windows. Leave these windows open and the large windows closed when you want privacy and good ventilation. There are many different brands and styles of tents out there. If you don't own one, maybe you can borrow one. Now let's talk about sleeping bags. Sleeping bags come in all different sizes, shapes, shells, and fillings. There are basically two different kinds your standard rectangular bag, and your mummy bag. Most rectangular bags can be unzipped and used as a blanket, or zipped together with another bag of the same size to make one giant sleeping bag. Mummy bags have a hood and are more form-fitting. They do a nice job of retaining body heat and fold up more compactly. Sizes, children's, and adults. Get one that's long enough for you. As far as the shell or outside cover is concerned, there are basically two types, cotton or nylon. Cotton's soft and washable, but if it gets wet, it stays wet. Nylon shells are a little tougher to clean, but they're usually treated to repel water, and a dirty bag is better than a wet one. Now for the fills, which more than anything else will determine the warmth and cost of the bag. Synthetic fills are usually made of some sort of polyester. The better ones will be specifically woven to retain their consistency and shape, and to keep your body heat in and the cool air out. Sleeping bags filled with goose down are more expensive, but they're also warmer, more durable, and will fold up more compactly. All sleeping bags, regardless of how they're made, have a warmth rating or a temperature range in which they'll keep you warm. Prices can range anywhere from $30 to $600. Where, when, and how often you camp will help you determine the sleeping bag that's right for you. Now that you've got your sleeping bag, you'll want to put something under it to cushion you from the cold, hard ground. Some people use blankets, others foam rubber pads, Still others use a portable cot. Personally, I like an air mattress. Air mattresses come in pretty much the same sizes as beds. Two queen-size mattresses in a six-man tent will comfortably support a group of four. When deflated, air mattresses are easy to transport and store. You can also use them at home when you have overnight guests. <laughs> If you're going to get an air mattress, don't scrimp. Spend some money and get a good quality mattress, something that won't leak and leave you flat on your back. Hey, a leaky air mattress can be a real pain in the neck, literally. Ugh. And while we're on the subject of pain, let's talk about inflating these puppies. Don't blow them up yourself. Get a pump. There are a wide variety of pumps to choose from. If you're on a budget, get a bicycle or foot pump. A little more expensive, but a lot more convenient, are these battery-operated pumps. This one 
uses four D-cell batteries and uses them up pretty fast. This one is rechargeable and has a larger motor. Both will also deflate an air mattress in a matter of seconds. There are also pumps you can plug into the lighter socket of your car, providing you have a car or a lighter socket. Whatever pump you decide on, be sure it has an adapter to fit the type of valve on your air mattress. Flashlights and a lantern are a must. Flashlights when you need a directional spotlight, lanterns when you need a broad floodlight. Be sure your lantern has a handle. That way you can hang it up and illuminate a larger area. Gas-fired lanterns throw the most light, but there are also some pretty nice fluorescent ones out there too. Do some research. Figure out the one that best fits your needs and your budget. Bring some cord and a pocket knife to cut it. Tie the cord between two trees for a clothesline. Use it to tie a garbage bag to a tree so certain animals can't get in. Maybe you'll need to tie down a trunk or hang a hammock. You'll find plenty of uses for cord during camping. Just be sure it's of a heavy enough gauge to do whatever you want it to. A whisk broom and a dustpan also come in handy during camping. Use them to sweep out your tent, your car, whatever. If you don't have a dustpan, don't worry. You can cut a paper plate in half and use that. Chairs. You're going to need chairs to set up around the campfire. Get the collapsible fabric kind. They're sturdy, durable, portable, and cheap. A doormat will reduce the amount of dirt tracked into your tent. Toilet paper and a first aid kit. You may not need either, but it's always best to be prepared. A pair of work gloves isn't a bad idea either, especially if you're hauling firewood or gear. And a hammer is always useful when it comes to knocking in and pulling out stakes. You're going to want something in which to store your food and drink. For unrefrigerated items, I like these collapsible crates. They're sturdy, stackable, and when they're empty, you just fold them up and tuck them away. Also nice are these plastic bins with hinge lids, mainly because you can leave them outside and not worry about critters getting in. These containers can be stacked when they're full and nested when they're empty. Coolers are essential for refrigerated items. If you've got the room, get one with at least a 48 gallon capacity. Be sure it has a snug fitting lid and a drain. I usually bring two coolers, one for beverages and one for food. That way I'm not opening one all the time and melting all my ice. If you only have room for one cooler, be sure to keep some ice in a plastic bag. This is the stuff that'll stay clean so you can use it in beverages. It's not unusual to drain and refill your coolers with fresh ice once or twice a day, especially if you keep opening them all the time. Be sure to have a good ice source nearby. Well, those are the basic items you'll be needing on your camping trip. We'll cover other items such as food and clothing a little later on in the program. Of course, now that you've got all the camping gear you could possibly need, the challenge is to get it all to the campground. This will not happen if you're driving a subcompact car. If you can't fit everything in your car, check to see if anyone going on the same trip has any room. If not, Consider renting or purchasing a rooftop carrier. These units attach quickly and easily to any vehicle, provide plenty of extra storage space, and they keep their contents dry in case of inclement weather. Of course, if you drive a minivan, you're in great shape. Pull out the back seat and you should have tons of room. Now, when packing your vehicle, the rule of thumb is to pack everything last that needs to come out first. In other words, get all your cooking utensils, clothing, food, coolers, and sleeping bags in first, and your tent, ground cloth, lanterns, and flashlights in last. Why the lanterns and flashlights? Because if you arrive at night, you're going to need a light. Cold weather isn't the ideal climate for camping, but sometimes you have no choice. In the morning, it's 78 and sunny, and by nightfall, the temperature has dropped 30 degrees. What do you do? Well, you could check into a motel, sleep in your car with the heater on, or 
If you're properly prepared, laugh at the weather and get a good night's sleep. A basic rule is, if you think it's going to be cold, bring everything you would normally wear for cold weather. That means a down coat, a knit hat, gloves or mittens, and if you've got them, down slippers and a down comforter. These garments aren't just for the evening either. This will be your sleeping attire. They say the only thing predictable about the weather is its unpredictability. So what do you do if it rains? Don't let a little rain put a damper on things. Put on some rain gear and you're ready to deal with the elements. If you wear a poncho or a raincoat, you can actually do stuff in the rain. I myself have had some mighty powerful frisbee games in the rain. Other recommendations on what to do if it rains. Stay in the tent and read a good book. Or go fish. With a deck of cards, that is. If you're camping near a town, catch a movie. Go bowling. Dine in a restaurant. Or go antiquing. Hey, don't let a little rain get you down. It'll pass, the sun will come out, and life will be good once again. Okay, so you've made it to the campground. The tent is up, the gear is in. What do you do next? Well, you could take a break. I mean, you worked hard. You deserve it. Crack open a cold one and relax. Okay, enough relaxation. There isn't much time left in this program and everyone's hungry. Let's talk food. Yeah. If you're going camping with a group of people, then you've got some meal planning to do. How many people are you going to feed? How often? Perhaps each person or family can be responsible for one meal or one day of meals for the entire group. Talk to each other beforehand. Good meal planning can prevent waste and starvation. As far as what food to bring, well, whatever you normally eat for breakfast, lunch, and dinner is what you'll bring. For quick and easy meals, you can always rely on staples like milk and juice, bread, cold cuts, peanut butter, cereal, and snacks. If you're cooking, think backyard barbecue, hot dogs, burgers, chicken, brats. Or if you get really ambitious, you can do breakfast, scrambled eggs, hash browns, sausage, toast. Hey, now that's camping. Okay, let's talk food preparation. Bring a cutting board, a sharp knife, paper plates and cups, plastic flatware, a roll of paper towels, which you can also use as napkins, and most importantly, heavy duty plastic garbage bags. Remember to tie your garbage bag to a tree to get it off the ground. A garbage bag left on the ground overnight is essentially a dinner invitation to Mr. Raccoon. And by the way, plastic garbage bags are also good for transporting wet bathing suits and towels. If you're cooking, raid your kitchen and bring whatever pots and pans you think you'll need. Don't forget a sponge or dishcloth, dishwashing soap, and a large water container for washing hands and dishes. I like to bring a tablecloth for the picnic table and some clips to hold the cloth in place. Fire up a couple citronella candles to add a little ambiance and keep the mosquitoes at bay. Now let's talk actual cooking. If you're into convenience and are willing to spend the money, a gas camping stove is pretty darn nice. Just screw on the gas canister. You may want to bring a couple extra. They're cheap. Open the valve. Light the burner, although many newer models have electronic ignition. And there you go. You can bring a small barbecue grill. Don't forget a wire brush to clean the grill. Match light charcoal, which is easier to light than regular charcoal. And of course, matches. Long stem fireplace matches are the best, but any matches will do. Of course, the best matches in the world don't mean diddly if they're wet. So to be safe, bring a lighter. If you don't have a camp stove or barbecue grill, you can always rely on your trusty campfire. The campfire is the heart of every campsite. It's your range, your clothes dryer, your TV set all in one. 
Campfires are magical to watch. They provide lots of warmth, heat for cooking and drying clothes. It's where everyone loves to gather and talk. Now before I go over how to cook on a campfire, I should probably explain how to get one started. Build your campfire in a clear, flat setting. Far enough away from tents, trees, and picnic tables so it doesn't turn into a five-alarm spectacle. Most public campsites have fire rings or some sort of metal or stone framework surrounding the campfire. This helps keep stray embers from straying too far. Okay, now you want to get some kindling. Small pieces of wood that'll burn quickly in order to get the fire started. Go out into the woods and gather some small branches. Pick them up off the ground. Cutting them off trees is a no-no. Green wood won't burn anyway. If you bought a bundle of firewood, there should be some narrowly cut wood in there. Use that. First, take a newspaper, or any paper for that matter, wad it up in a ball, and place it in the middle of the fire ring. Now you're going to build a little teepee around it. Use the kindling first. Then surround it with larger logs. Okay, now you're just about ready for ignition. Light the paper in the middle, which in turn will burn the kindling, which in turn will burn the logs. All right, you're not gonna have a real flamer in 10 seconds. It's going to take a little work. You may have to relight it a few times, blow on the embers, stoke it a bit, but eventually you will succeed. For cooking over the fire, you can buy a grill that has folding legs. A tripod grill can be set up over the fire, and the height of the grill can be adjusted to the height of the flames. Pretty cool, huh? Many fire pits also have grills attached. When you're done cooking and everyone's eaten, you must religiously follow camping tradition and carefully prepare s'mores. S'mores? Come on! You gotta know what s'mores are. For the unenlightened, s'mores are only the most delicious camping treat of all time. First, you take a graham cracker and place an equally sized piece of a chocolate bar on top. Next, find yourself a good long stick or a really long fork and roast a marshmallow over your glowing campfire. Place the roasted marshmallow on top of the chocolate, close it up with another graham cracker, and voila! You've got yourself a s'more. So named, because once you eat one, you're gonna want some more. <laughs> At night after dinner, s'mores, singing, storytelling, joking, laughing, and all those other fun things you do around a campfire. When everyone else has retired for the evening, don't forget to put out your campfire. Pour some water on the remaining ashes and make sure the embers are glowing no more. Because the last thing you want is to wake up in the morning to the sight and smell of your smoldering belongings. You get a real sense of accomplishment when you're camping. That's because you make it what it is. You assemble your own shelter, you prepare your own meals, and the better you get at it, the more enjoyment you get out of it. We hope this program has provided you with the fundamentals, and I do mean fundamentals, for making your next camping trip a great one. We leave you now with images of just a few of the things that make camping the wonderful pastime that it is.
We hope you've enjoyed this documentary. We hope it's been helpful.